presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. That is the biblical response to those that say, it doesn't matter what day you go to church, it doesn't matter how you were baptized, you are going to keep sinning until Jesus comes back. When I hear that, I just shut up and I just let them unload. And then I say, you know what? You have made my sinful nature very, very happy. He said, what? He said, yeah, because my sinful nature wants to go to heaven. Not on God's terms, but on my sinful nature's terms. So you can just, I cannot express to you how happy my sinful nature is just from what you have heard. Share with me. Now, make my day. Share with me from Scripture where that thing comes from. Because in verse 22, <coughs> it says, But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. My sinful nature is not going to like that. But my question is, yes, beautiful. My question is, share with me from Scripture what you have related to me. That I'm going to keep sinning until Jesus comes back. And then you show up. And they're going to speculate. And you have to come back with a smile, very softly. And where is that found in Scripture? And you just look at your Bible. <laughs> It ain't there. But that is what many people are willing to accept today. Rather than going to Scripture and accepting what God has inspired to be recorded. <coughs> when God forgives and forgets a sin, is that the end of his involvement? with us. <coughs> Who would like to read 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4? 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. Over here, right? 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. And when you're there, say ready, and then we'll read. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. Okay. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Thank you. <coughs> we talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit created everything. And everyone says, Amen. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have the power to produce what the Bible says <coughs> I will experience and the believers and those that will eventually go to heaven must experience on planet earth before Jesus can come back. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 5 from the right in Galatians. Ephesians chapter 5 and I'm going to read to you verses 25 26 and 27. Here is an analogy or a parable. Jesus uses the marriage relationship to describe his relationship with the church many times. Here he inspires the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. 
How would you like for that to be the finished product in your Christian experience? Amen. Well, Jesus cannot come back until there's a generation of people that decide to experience that. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have the power to do that in me? If I give it permission. Remember Romans 8 9? But you are no longer under the influence of the flesh, but of the Spirit. If, so be it, that the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. What does the word if mean? You and I have a choice. A choice to what? Either open that door or not. That is our participation in this. The Holy Spirit does the rest. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. Did everyone that Jesus heal or relieve of some deformity or ailment express appreciation to him for what he had done for them? No. Did that lack of appreciation make any difference to Jesus? And it shouldn't to us either. We should respond to every opportunity that the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, ears to, and leave the crediting or the appreciation to Christ. What we do need to know is that when we reap, when we sow, in due season, what will happen? We will reap. Galatians 6.10 So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially to those who are of the household, household of the faith. The best response to that, because it's a little vague in English language, is to go to Luke chapter 6. Let's go to Luke chapter 6. And who would like to read Luke chapter 6, verse 33 through 35? Volunteers? Okay, Linda? Luke chapter 6, verses 33 through 35. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? Even For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for if He is kind, for He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father in heaven is merciful. Thank you. Does that mean that we show no wisdom in just giving, 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 without evaluating the request for the need? and the source that that request is coming from, and how this person who is in a very, who's in a very terrible situation has either consistently brought this situation on themselves, or this is an isolated case where someone maybe has made a mistake or set of circumstances has overtaken this person and they really genuinely, genuinely need help. Should we use wisdom in the way that we give? Of course. All right. I don't want for anyone to misunderstand that. Uh, Galatians 6, 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Apparently, some dishonest people wrote letters to the churches that Paul had ministered to without Paul's permission. And apparently, these letters, not authorized, by Paul, created a lot of problems in these churches. Uh, I'm going to briefly read to you 2 Thessalonians 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. That you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Does that need explanation? <clears throat> it's very important for us to be thankful that God opens the opportunity for us to share. But it's also very important for us to mind our own business and not go beyond where God has opened opportunity for us to do or say. Okay. So Paul solves the situation in 2 Thessalonians 3.17 by making a statement that he makes in most of his letters, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way he finishes, concludes most of these letters. In fact, in Galatians, uh, he opens Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, by saying, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave him, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from all fight, iniquity. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Here's a battle. Verse 12. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. What does that mean? False brethren seeking to persuade the Galatian converts to trust in what? Self, visual, righteous works, rather than trusting in the guarantee of the Holy Spirit to produce righteous works in us. Is that important for us to understand this? Mm -hmm. I used to be attacked, I still am, uh, when I presented these truths. And uh, so I learned to ask questions. What are we dealing with here in verse 12? Those who try to compel you to be circumcised simply that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. What does that mean? I can tell you what it means today. Okay. <clears throat> if you tell somebody what we know about righteousness, <clears throat> that the, any righteousness that comes from anything has been produced by God in us, people, uh, uh, without using the slang, they, they kind of wig out, they get excited, they get upset, and they're sure that if you tell this to people, nobody will do anything to promote the gospel, that everybody will just sit down and have their own righteousness, or that they will do even worse, they will um, go into unrighteousness and expect that God is doing everything, that there'll be no cooperation, that people will be sinners, that you can't just say that and expect the church to do well. It's all, it's all based on fear that God won't do what he said he would do. So we have to add a little to this to, to uh, motivate the people to do what we think they ought to be doing. And that's, that's, a, that's a conflict that goes on all the time. And ever since I became an Adventist, I've been hearing it. Okay. Does that sound familiar? When I come across that situation, I just get right to the point and I say, does the good works, does the righteous, do the righteous works that the Holy Spirit produced in me contribute in quantity or quality to my salvation? No. If it's an Adventist, 
I would say to them, do the good works that the Holy Spirit produced in me, is that part of the gospel? No. And one of those two questions, they'll say yes. Because that's what they have been taught. Okay? So let me read to you from Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, some translations say works, which we have done in righteousness. Is that good? Works of righteousness. Is that good? That the Holy Spirit produces in men. Is that good? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's how we were created. To produce works of righteousness. Ephesians 2.10. From the foundation of the world. Now look. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So back to the question. Do the righteous works that the Holy Spirit produced in me contribute in quantity or quality to my salvation? No. Or are they part of the gospel? Not according to Scripture. But are good works, righteous works, important? Yes. They're more than important. They're absolutely necessary. Because that's the evidence that the Holy Spirit is producing in us to show that the gospel works. How else is anyone going to be genuinely drawn to Christianity, to Christ? Except they see Christ's character being reproduced in a member of the human race. Could anything be more attractive than that? Than a human being that is allowing Jesus to reproduce his character in them? No. Nothing could be more impressive than that. Nothing. The question is, does it contribute in quantity or quality to my salvation? That is the issue here with the entire book of Galatians, with the entire book of Romans. Even from the Old Testament, in Jeremiah. Well, we're going to get to it in a moment. Chuck, <clears throat> question? No question. Just making a point of that, in Colossians 3.17, it, it refers to this. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So this is the the good works is just giving glory to God. Thank you. Galatians six thirteen. Back to Galatians six thirteen. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. What did we learn from Galatians 5.17? The flesh and the spirit are incompatible with each other, and they are at war with each other so that you are not able to do the things that you wish. What are the things that Chuck wishes to do from the time that he wakes up in the morning? <laughs> In my case, it's everything bad and illegal. That's the way I am. That's the way I wake up. Do we understand that? The war... <laughs> Quit blaming Satan for everything. We inherit a sinful nature from our great-grandparents, Adam and Eve. And that is the issue. That's why Jesus came to this world. To show that in my flesh... Agape love conquers the flesh. Why? So that I can be saved? Or so that the character of God can be vindicated? Because that's the issue on planet Earth. There is no other issue. Satan said in heaven, I'm rebelling. And he was masterful and clever enough to deceive a third of the population in heaven. In the atmosphere of heaven where you can interact one-on-one -on -one with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, in that atmosphere, this mentality succeeded in deceiving a third of the population. In that atmosphere, where all of you want to be taken to. Are you paying attention? So how in the name of common sense do you think that you, regardless of how long you've been a Christian, or what, how many generations of Christians you come from, or how well you know about what in the name of common sense gives you the thought that you can possibly deal with Satan one-on-one. -on -one? It is 
insane to not access the Holy Spirit in dealing with every decision, experience, and temptation. Amen. And you're not witnessing for God when you have the opportunity to share with someone else and you don't take them to Scripture, but give them, recite some passage. There's some key passages that you can learn so that you can share with everyone. Because the issue is, here is the answer. Here's where the answers and the solutions come from. You don't have to memorize anything, but you need to be reasonably acquainted with these issues that we've been studying for 14 weeks in the book of Galatians. What does God say He's going to do with these false teachers from the Old Testament? Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26. Who would like to read that for us? Jeremiah chapter 9, 25 and 26. Okay, I'll read it. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 9, not 29. I misspoke. Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26. When you're there, say ready. ready. And I will read Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26. Here we go. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. What is that saying? You may be physically circumcised, but in the heart are you circumcised. Is that not the issue in the entire book of Galatians? Okay, 26. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all those inhabiting the desert who cut the hair, the, hair, the hair on their temples. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. Is that something that I can apply to me? Yes. Today? Yes. If I don't, I'm going to make the same mistake they did. Galatians 6.14 But may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Galatians ends where it begins. Deliverance. From where? From this present evil world. Galatians 1.4 it is the cross of Christ that accomplishes that deliverance. The cross is the symbol of what? Humiliation. Therefore, I must glory in it. Because my sinful self does not want to be humiliated. It wants to be exalted. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, we learn... That the Godhead took the initiative to do something very, very special for the human race. I want for all of you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. When you're there, say ready, and I will quote it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Ready. But by God's doing, there's the initiative. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us what? Wisdom. Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and what else? Redemption. Redemption. Who took the initiative? God. The Godhead. Wisdom from God. That is a very interesting word in the Greek language. It spells Sophia. But we get the word sophisticated. God has given us very, very special knowledge, understanding of the scriptures, especially this church. Two other people in the audience today were studying last night about important topics in the Bible. And the unique knowledge that God has given this church in the books of Daniel, chapter 7, Daniel 8, and also Hebrews chapter 9. When God has a generation of people experiencing these truths, then and only then will Jesus be able to return. By God's doing, God's initiative, you are in Christ Jesus. 
by God's doing. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that he has permission to do that. That's called the objective gospel. Remember John 3.16? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the objective aspect. The subjective is what? And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a subjective aspect. So the objective aspect in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 is, by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. That's the objective fact. What's the subjective? Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Christ in you, the hope of what? Glory. Yeah. And that comes when you and I choose to open the door that the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, is taking the initiative to knock on. That's our contribution. That's it. Did we get it? Someone's knocking on the door in your heart. Are you going to open the door or are you going to leave it closed? That's it. That's our contribution. Then if we open the door, what happens? He comes in and takes over our life. So we glory in the wisdom of God. And we glory in the knowledge of God. One text says we glory in, in the wisdom of God and in the knowledge of God. So, the scriptural conclusion to this, as well as our study, because our bell is in the rain for you soon, is what? Eternal life is found where? In Jesus alone. In Jesus alone. And what aspect of Jesus are we talking about? The cross. The cross. The cross is the only thing that has power to save folks. It's the only thing. And it represents shame to the world, but it represents life eternal to the believer. Amen. And until you're ready to be crucified with Christ, there is not going to be any significant change in your life. Because it's the cross, the humiliation of the cross, to say, I am helpless, I can do nothing. All I can do is open that door and admit that I can do nothing and let the Holy Spirit take over. That's the only thing that we can do. If it is your will to become a new creation in Christ, I invite you to read with me again Galatians 6, verse 14. You ready? But may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Do you see a similarity there between that passage and Galatians 2.20? Yes. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I still have a pulse. <laughs> Yet not I, but Christ living in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of Jesus Christ who gave himself for me. When we use the expression, the biblical expression, the faith of Jesus Christ, we must understand that what Paul is writing about in Romans 12, verse 3, to each one has been given a measure of what? What faith? Faith the faith of Jesus or okay you've got a little bit of faith now I want for you to go out there and exercise it it's the former the faith of Jesus the faith that conquered Satan in my equipment my condition so the ultimate experience on planet earth is to find a generation of people that chooses to live their lives as Christ did. Turning every decision, experience, and temptation over to whom? To His Heavenly Father. And allowing what I call the designated driver, the Holy Spirit, to lead Him for three, thirty-three and a half years. Which the Holy Spirit is supposed to answer us to do when? When you open that door. 
when I open up that door. And he says, let's go. <laughs> let's prove to the world that what Jesus did is a not, not an isolated incident. Incident. Then he closed by reading a sentence from Christ Object Lessons, page 69. How many of you would like for Jesus to come soon? Okay. Do you know that you can determine when Jesus comes back? Here it is. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself and his church. When the